Hey, Prime members, you can listen to Morbid early and ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the app today. In Season 3 of the hit true crime podcast, Cold, I, Dave Cauley, investigate the disappearance of a young mother, Cherie Warren. We'll try to find out if either of the two men in her life, both with abusive pasts, were responsible for her death. Listen to Cold, the search for Cherie, on Amazon Music or wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, weirdos. I'm Elena. I'm Ash. And this is Morbid. It's morbid in the afternoon. <laughs> we do it all day. We do it in the morning. We do it at night. We do it in the afternoon. And sometimes we do it at night night. It's like night, but different and later. And sometimes morning morning, which yeah, is earlier, like morning, <laughs> but earlier. But now it's just in the nice afternoon after we've had a salad. It's actually 333, which is my good luck time. Oh, look at that. I know. Oh, man. An angel number. I saw 222 and I saw 333 today. Ooh, I keep seeing 444s four, four, four in my life. Yeah, you love 444. Four, four. Yeah. Um, I already told you this, so it won't be new to you. But I saw this TikTok, guys, and it was saying, it was like, you're at like a change in your life. And I almost scrolled past, but then I said, I'm woo. Let me hear it. I'm woo. I'm woo. <laughs> Tell me about it. It said, you're going to start seeing repeating numbers. I said, check. I see angel numbers all the time. Even like not even times, but like addresses. Like I'll drive past yeah. a house and I'm like, oh shit, 555. Five, five. Look at that. Um. And then it said, you're going to start waking up in the night between like three and four in the morning. And then when you go, or, and it said that, and I was like, okay, I already do that. Literally every night I wake up at three. Um, and then it said, you're going to start having these vivid, vivid dreams, which in the morning, like once you've gone back to sleep, which has started happening to me. I've told Elena about some of my crazy ass dreams. This guy knew. And he knew. And I forget what happens after that. It wasn't bad. Um, but I mean, I'm at like a point of spiritual awakening, I guess. Oh, look at you. And it's funny because a lot of you guys actually have been messaging me seeing if I'm okay. <laughs> which um, we appreciate, by Which the way. I appreciate. I'm totally fine. We had like some family stuff going on, which like sucked, but I don't want to really talk about it. Yeah, that's why we had to, we missed one listener tale last week, I believe it was. Yeah, um, yeah. But I was out of the office. I had I had to attend some stuff. Yeah, um, there was some stuff going on, but everything's okay. But everything's cool. Everything's good and gravy. <laughs> but I, I'm at a spiritual awakening in my life, so that's fun. That is fun. Yeah, but you know, oh my God, do you know what we get to do? I think it's two weeks from this week. What? So so in two weeks, I was like, well, what? <laughs> we can What's go to the on? obituary show. We can go to the obituary show. Yes, I'm, hell yeah! I'm very excited about obituary. Obituary, our um, our show that's on our network with it's not our show. It's Spencer and Madison's <laughs> show, but they're on our Mormon network. But they're our babies. Um, they are going on a world tour, like yeah. a straight up world tour. I've shared the, and I know you have too. Is it a world tour? Is there like a a national tour. Well, it's a U.S. tour. <laughs> I was like, wait, are they leaving the country? No, not yet. Anyways, <laughs> not yet. I don't. I'm not here to spoil. I'm not going to limit there. Yeah, I'm not going to clip their wings. It's called manifestation. <laughs> Look it up. So <laughs> they they currently right now are on a U.S. tour. Sorry, Europe. Um, but we get to go to the Boston show. We're going to be there. And if Hell you're yeah, not are. there to support our friends. Are you even our friends? Are you even our friends? Oh my god, that show is gonna be March first, and I am so fucking stoked about it. Uh, March third, they're gonna be in New York City. March sixth, Washington D.C. March eighth, I'm reading all of these to you, just so you know. <laughs> Philadelphia. The 29th, they're gonna be in San Francisco, California, y'all. Whoa. Then they go to Portland, March 31st, and for the rest, I'm not gonna read all of them to you because that's actually a lot. I, I started saying it, and then I was like, maybe I shouldn't do that. We're gonna <laughs> link the rest of the show dates in. In our show, show notes. notes and we will post them on instagram but i think you guys should come see us at the boston show hang out with us and see spencer and madison put be, on the glorious show of, of ever be the beautiful goddesses that they are be supportive geoffs hell yeah or else because that show is so fucking funny guys oh my God, they're I so good wait. and they're like the most delightful people ever 
So it's support them. Yeah, they're some of my favorites. So yeah, we'll put the link to their um, all their upcoming shows and then where you can buy tickets in our show notes. Indeed. Yay. So come join us at the obituary show on the East Coast. Let's go. Let's fucking go, girls. I am ready for that. I can't wait. I'm so excited. Uh, you know what I'm not excited about, though? Part two of Harvey Glavin. Part two of Harvey Glavin. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually going to need you to just like head right into this because you left on yeah. a fucking cliffhanger and a half. I sure did. I think when I left you guys, we talked about the third victim, which is Ruth Marcato. Um, he's already killed two other women at this point. He's attacked countless others. I was going to say, it feels like so much more than that because he's just attacking everybody left and right like a big giant asshole. Yeah, it's pretty terrible. And he's doing it in... in Kind of the same way each time. He's got a really, like, pretty consistent MO. Mm -hmm. He uses rope. He strangles. He brings them out to the L.A. desert. Claims he doesn't want to do it. Claims he doesn't want to do it. It's it's all ridiculous. He's really annoying. It's so crazy to me that he, and I think I said this last time too, but I'm saying it again. I'm saying it. I'm saying it. He says that he doesn't want to do this. Like, oh, I, I, I sat there and I really struggled with myself. But then he does the exact same thing every time. So clearly... You liked this. You didn't yeah. do this thinking you were getting any different kind of result. No, he's a lying sack of shit. It makes for me sure. angry. Like, if you're, like, don't be a murderer, step one. But yeah. step two, fucking own your shit. Yeah. He's, own it. He's definitely a lying sack of shit. And we're going to see at the end of this episode, you're going to get a little little glimpse at him that you're like, you're, yeah. Like, you don't feel any or No, any I don't think he does whatsoever. Anyway. And what's even worse about this is this took place in like the late 50s. And the LAPD for Ruth Mercado's murder, uh, her photo didn't appear in the LAPD bulletin. I said this at the end of last episode, yeah. but just to recap you, it didn't appear in there until two months That's after she so had gone insane. missing. And the notes on it were may seek employment at nude modeling or as a stripper and mental condition poor. It's like, um, who did you ask about that? It's like, I don't know. I think the guy who did this, his mental condition is poor. Yeah. I would say. Some would say even worse than that. And I think this was one of those things where they they looked at it like, oh, she, she was a stripper. Yeah. And a nude model. So who gives a shit? It's like, okay, first of all... I know that all you detectives have Playboy under your bed, so I yeah. don't know what your issue is with nude models. And second of all, you're all going to strip clubs, so what's and it's your a problem? Job. And it's a job. They are going to a job, and they are making money. Exactly. Shut the fuck up. I don't under. I hate how that just like played, and I'm sure still, and we know still does play a part. Oh in yeah. Cases. It's like who gives a fuck what somebody does as a yeah. profession as long as they're not hurting themselves or someone else. Exactly. And it's like, who are you to say what is a valid profession and what isn't? Yeah. Like, you, you could say that about anything. Like, we're podcasters. That doesn't sound like a valid profession. Like, you know what I mean? And like I've had many people look at me like but, it's not a valid profession. But, but we do it. It's yeah. a job. Like, it's how it pays our bills. Like, that's it's like, that's what a job is. Exactly. Like, you go, you work, you work hard, you put your energy into it. And it pays your bills. Right. That's supposed to be what it is, at least. It's like, it's so fucked up. It is. I don't like it. No, it makes me mad. So, unfortunately, we ended on another murder. But we are going to enter into, finally, him getting caught. Good. And uh, not because he was caught through, like, good old-fashioned police work. Never. This is the 50s, isn't it? Nope. He was caught because this bad, bad bitch... Lorraine got away from him. Oh, I like that name a lot. Yeah. Lorraine really went for it. I was going to say, I said this is the 50s, and I forgot to mention the LAPD is on the case. Exactly. So there's a lot working against this That's in the 50s. That's called a lose-lose. That is a lose-lose situation at this point in time, at least. And so after murdering Judy Dull, Shirley Bridgeford, and Ruth Marcato, Harvey was almost immediately ready to kill again. He was not... Now he's, like, really amping up. Yeah, he did not want to wait, but he did let six months pass by. He wanted to kill right again, but he was... He knew there was some heat on, not necessarily on him, mm -hmm. but he didn't want to slip up. Yeah. Fortunately for us, he does. Good. Now, and, during... And everyone else. Exactly. Now, during this time, he got another job as a TV repairman, a repairman, because remember, he did that in Sing Sing Prison. Like, that was what he would make his money on on the side. Oh my God, I forgot that he went to Sing Sing. Yeah, he sure did. He went to Sing Sing Prison. Uh, in, but at this point, he was kind of starting to lose it a bit. And lose it in the sense that he could not stop thinking of abducting and killing women. Jesus. Like, he was obsessing over it. Like, 
could he couldn't keep his his mind in his normal everyday you know day job he obsessively was looking at photos of the women that he had killed that he had he kept in his little toolbox yeah. there he would spend hours just going through the trophies he had stolen from them like the shoes and the underwear the pieces of fabric so things crazy. from their purse like all he could think about was doing it again he obsessed over it i hate this this also shows you he doesn't have remorse no like, this isn't a guy that's like, oh, no, I did that. I shouldn't have done that. No, he loves it. That's why he kept that shit, so he can relive it 100 more Reliving, times. Reliving, obsessing, just like, no, he loves what he's doing. You're not remorseful if you are just wanting to relive the situation. Like, if you're remorseful, you never want to think of that situation no. again. Yeah. So in late October of 1958, he was officially back on the hunt. But he was so eager and so fucking lazy that he didn't even bother to use another fake name. He just went with Frank Johnson again, which was uh, the same one he used last time. And up until this point, he switched every time. He's been switching and it's been working for him. And he did the same photographer trick this time, which mm. you would think he would get out of that because he had once other one other time with Shirley Bridgeford. He did the Lonely Hearts thing. Right. Because he knew people were going to be looking at photographers. Yep. Now he's already killed again as a fake photographer named Frank Johnson. And he's going right back to that. Mm -hmm. So he's losing it. He's He's getting too eager. This obsession, this pathology is taking him over and he's making mistakes. Yeah. So he took to the paper to look for his next victim, and he ended up finding an ad for a modeling studio called the Diane Studio. It was a modeling agency on Sunset Boulevard, and it specialized in pinup modeling. Okay. So on October 27th, he showed up to the Diane Studio and said he was Frank Johnson, a professional magazine photographer, and he needed models for a campaign. It's really gross to me that he does it this way, because it's like... He's going to a place and he's just essentially purchasing women to murder. Yeah. Like he's paying, like, he's like, I would like to hire a model. Mm -hmm. I'm going to pay for that. And then I'm just going to take her out to the desert and murder her, torture yeah. her and murder her. Yeah. It's like, that is so fucked up that he is able to do that. I know. I didn't really think of it like that. Until when you, you look at that, it as like, right. the, yeah, the, like the nuts and bolts of it. Yeah. Like strip everything else away. This is him walking into a place saying, Hel hello, I'd like to pay this much money for to have this girl come so I can take pictures. And nobody her. knows. And nobody under knows because that is a legitimate job yep. and that is a legitimate transaction. Yeah. It's like, unfortunately, it's the perfect way for him to do it. Truly. It was the perfect way. He was able to get any women that he wanted. But then at the same time, it's not the perfect way because you can't keep up with that for too long. That's true. You're going to run out of places. They're going to start recognizing you. to it. And if you're using the same name like this idiot, then they're really going to start catching on. But what is even more wild about this is exactly what we were just saying. He had actually photographed Diane of the Diane studio oh, a shit. few times Does before. She, own, she owns the she studio? She owns the studio. Damn. And she must have been, you know, I think she was probably in the beginning when I told you he first moved to L.A. Yeah. And he was trying to, like, work out how he would do all this and he was taking pictures she was like without a practice person yeah i think he was she was probably in the beginning there and when he showed up on this day she recognized him Uh oh but she had previously found him so creepy mm -hmm. and did like off-putting she's like i'm not sending you one of my girls oh no unfortunately she didn't want to go with him oh no but she said she would find a model for him that is yeah. not like, women that was supporting not cool. women. She did not want to turn away a paying customer, so she threw him That's another model. That's really fucked. I promise you there will be another paying customer. Yeah. That if, like, if somebody Regretful gives you the thing creeps, why would you ever sick them on another woman? On another woman? Yeah, that bummed me out when yeah. I read it. I would never do that. Because obviously I don't think there was, like, a, an intent, you no, know what I mean? No, obviously not. To be, like, a dick there, but it's like... But that's a dick Why move. Why were you thinking of that? Like, if you found this man creepy and off-putting enough that you yourself will not pose for him. Right. Why would you put another one of your girls on him? Like, like I might say, oh, yeah, like, I'll find you another girl and then just not return But I call. just wouldn't. Right. Yeah, I'd be like, sorry, no one wants to work yeah. with you. No. Because you're weird. I don't Maybe, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago my answer would have been different or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I don't so know. maybe she was young and just maybe. She wasn't thinking. Yeah, I don't know. But it... it it gave me like a, ooh. I was like, come on. Yeah. That sucks. Yeah. Especially because of what happens.
Decades before Anna Delvey began scamming her way into high society, Christian Carl Gerhardt's writer was infiltrating America's most elite circles with little more than a fake name and a lot of charm. Bold, ruthless, and willing to kill, Gerhardt's writer embarked on a caper across the West Coast, successfully evading the FBI for decades. Hi, I'm Sachi Cole, co-host of Wondery's podcast, Scamfluencers, where we unpack the lives and schemes of some of the biggest scammers and con artists. In our recent two-part series, Three Weddings and a Funeral, high society's top social circles become a playground for a fraudster. Follow Scamfluencers wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen ad-free on the Amazon Music or Wondery app. So she threw him another model, 28-year-old Lorraine Vigil. Mm -hmm. Lorraine had been working as a secretary when she came across the ad for the Diane Modeling Studio, and she decided, you know what, I'm going to give it a try. Well, I want to make some, exactly some extra money. She wanted to change up her her routine a little bit. She was like, you know what, I'm just going to spice it up a well, little bit. Well, it's like bit. a hobby, you know. I'm a beautiful woman. Why not? I'm gorgeous. You know? Let's go, girls. And in fact, Lorraine had only been with the agency for a few days oh when God. she got the call from Diane. Wow. And she got the call a little after 9 p.m. that night saying that there was a job for her and she would be and that Diane was going to be sending Frank Johnson by her apartment to pick her up within the hour. Okay. This is all very shady. I'm also like, can we not have them picked up at their apartment? I know. Guys? I'm like, there should have been a better <clears throat> protocol here. Yeah. Like one Pick place them up at where, the office. Yeah, like uh, they have to come to the studio. <clears throat> yeah, excuse me. Sorry, I was a little horse there. <laughs> a little horse. So she's getting ready and Diane calls her back. As she's getting ready. And Diane says, listen, I know I'm sending you out with this guy. I just want to warn you that he is, quote, sort of creepy and definitely not a pro photographer. So be careful. What the fuck? Yeah. If he's not even a pro photographer, then what are we doing here, ma'am? And that's and so I feel bad for Lorraine here because she's like, I'm okay. already getting ready. She's only been here a few days. She probably doesn't feel like she can refuse a client at this point. And that's the thing. So she's like, okay. And then she's like, maybe because I'm new, Diane's just being extra cautious and like over warning right. me kind of thing. Like she didn't really think much of it because she was like, I'm new. So maybe she's just being extra cautious. Also from a business standpoint, <clears throat> why would you want to give one of your newest girls a bad experience right off the bat? She's not going to come back and model exactly. for you. Exactly. Like that's just bad business. It didn't, I didn't really understand a lot of this thought process. As Tatiana says, choices. Yeah, choices truly. Uh, but, you know, she was like, whatever. So a little past 10 p.m., Harvey knocks on Lorraine's apartment door. He says, hello, I am Frank Johnson. I'm a no, magazine photographer. And immediately she reminded him that Diane insists on getting the money up front. Ah, uh, well, that's good business. Good for Lorraine. Lorraine. She was like, mm -mm. you should always get your money yeah. up front. Always get your money up front. Never wait because people will fucking, they'll, they'll fuck it up. Yeah, they'll fuck with you. <laughs> people will fuck with you if they are allowed to fuck with you. So don't let people yeah. fuck with you. They might even keep your money. Yeah, they'll keep your money. So like, don't let them do that. And no. this, and Harvey tried to pull that shit of so like it's did. true because if you don't get it up front they're gonna try to pull some bullshit and give you less yeah and like not to keep quoting people but to quote my good girl Riri, <laughs> bitch but i have my money there you go pay me what you owe me and lorraine was like that's pay what she me said. what you owe me like yeah. you're not coming in this apartment <clears throat> you're not getting my services if you're not paying for them no i don't work for free mama so she th they had agreed upon 22 dollars Okay. Which again, this is in the fifties. So I know, like, I'll I know. do the conversion. You, I was you keep talking. Say. So they had agreed upon twenty two dollars. He decided that he was going to give her ten dollars, and then he did convince her that he will give her the rest later. Oh, honey, no. Yeah, he won't. Unfortunately, because people pleasing is a real thing, and we've all been there. Yeah, that you're in a situation where you feel like you can't argue. Mm -hmm. She didn't argue, and she just said, "Okay." She accepted it. And she accepted his promise that he was going to give the rest before the session. And by the way, it would have been like two seventy five. So there you go. It's good. Like amount of that's money. a good amount of money. So he really he gave a, less than half of that. Yeah. Fuck off. Which that's fucked up. So Lorraine was immediately put off by this Frank Johnson fucking character. I would have been put off by that shit too. Hell yeah. She and on top of being like weird about the money situation he smelled like cigarettes she said mm. and he had bo ew which like i bleh, like i would 
That would have been it for me. Insult behavior. Yeah, I, he is such an insult. Take a goddamn shower. And she said he was every bit the creep Ew. that Diane had mentioned. I'm angry at Diane. I'm a little angry at Diane as well. But once they were in the car, because they were going to be going to the studio, the Diane yeah. studio. Because that's the other thing I should say. The reason that, like, he would come pick her up at the house is because a lot of times, especially in L.A. at this time, people didn't have cars. Oh, okay. So, and it's not like you could call an Uber and just go to the, Why? the studio. Why not? So, a lot of times, these photographers would drive them to the studio. So, it's like part an of extra the deal. deal. Okay, part so, of it's kind of part of it. So, he was driving them to the studio, and then Harvey, all of a sudden, on the way there... Said that there's a change of plans. No, there's not. As we know, when Harvey says there's a change of plans, you don't listen to him. Mm-mm. But he says that there's a change of plans and that Diane had some other people coming into the studio, so it was taken up. So they would have to use his studio in Anaheim. Okay. So Lorraine was like, all right. Like, she just kind of was reluctant, but she was like, ah, all right, whatever. Like, who am I? To argue with all this, this is probably the way things always go. Because that's the thing. It's like when you're in, when you're new to something like that, you're probably like, is this this just par for the course? You know, like I am in LA. Yeah. <laughs> because that's just how things go. Like people are going to give you less than what they owe you. And they're exactly. going to try. They're going to change plans on the way to the studio. Mm-hmm. And this is probably fine. So she was just like, okay, whatever. But she did say every alarm bell was ringing in her head. Yeah. Trust and unfortunately, gut. the benefit of hindsight is always easier. Totally. But like trusting your gut is definitely a real thing. But then also at that point, it's like, what are you even going to do? What are you going to do at that point? Like, so all your only option at that point is tuck and roll. You got to think of a plan, basically. That's, yeah. But that would be very stressful. Um, and at the same time, Harvey is attempting to kind of like ease her anxiety. Mm-hmm. Like, because he likes to get them comfortable. Yeah. He likes to, he doesn't want everybody screaming and yelling. Remember, Makes it easier the second a woman turns around and challenges him in any way, he flees. Remember, yep. that's happened a few times. Like, he cannot handle a woman turning around and surprising him with any kind of No, that's reaction. literally when he dips. So, but uh, but these women don't know that. So he so his whole thing is that he likes to get them calm, he likes to get them to trust him until he has that gun out and then he can really control you. But before that, he's got to keep you docile. Exactly. He doesn't want you jumping at him. So, he's kind of just telling her about this fictional job that he has come up with, what they're going to be shooting, how, you know, this is going to be great. She's so beautiful. You could even make the cover. You're that beautiful. Like, this magazine, they're going to love you. He is hyping her up. He's hyping her up. And he's like, you know what? I think if these photos really make it, then you are definitely cover model material. Oh, man. So, she's like, oh, this is great. But then as they kept driving south toward the desert, Uh, they got on the Santa Ana freeway. And Lorraine... Is suddenly not feeling as at ease okay, as she like, started where are to feel. We going? Because she said that, quote, he began driving at a tremendous speed. Oh. And then she said, he would never answer my questions or even look at me. Oh. He just stopped. I've I've like heard that in other cases yep. when it, they just like will not answer you. And they just go into that oh zone. Oh my god, that would be so scary. It really is like a fucking like animal putting on like yeah. hunter mode you it know what truly I mean? is it's like they just click it off it's like it's how like, wolves like who's yeah. watching a tiktok about wolves like they can like play with you and stuff but when that animal instinct kicks in it's like snap they're a different beast it's so true and she said it was clear to her that something bad was happening right now and she was really in full panic especially when he pulled off the freeway and onto the shoulder oh god and this is when he told her he had a flat tire and she was no, like i don't, don't think you have a flat tire but she was in full flight or fright, fright mode, so she was about to take off running. She was like, I had a plan. I was going to bolt. Like, Hell yeah. as soon as he got out of the car, I was getting out of there. But before she could, he pulled out the gun. Oh, my God. And he said, I'm an ex-con, and I'll kill you. I don't give a darn if I go to the gas chamber. Oh, Which my. is not something you want to hear. No. Nope. And he tried to force her to get her hands behind her back so she he could tie them. But she shocked him. She did something he was not expecting. She just grabbed the barrel of the motherfucking gun. Oh, my God. And screamed at him while trying to wrench the gun away from him. What a brave girly. He was 
shocked. Me as well. Shocked. And you he just fought back. Grab the barrel of a gun. Like yeah, she just she's grabbed like, I'm not the ga- barrel. Not today, motherfucker. I, t- today Holy is not the day, shit. and I'm not the one, no. Harvey or Frank. I should say. Oh my god. Yeah, grabbed it. She's yelling. He's yelling. She's trying to wrench it out of his hands, and he's yelling, "Just do I what I tell you, and you won't get hurt." Which L O motherfucking like, that's not L. true. I love that. I, it made me think of the uh, Buffy episode that we just watched on the rewatcher. Actually, you guys gotta listen to that. It's great. Uh, but it is it's so, so much fun. Uh, we love doing that. It's just like a really fun show. Yeah. But there was an episode where like Angel is getting his ass oh, kicked by yeah. Kendra all over the place and gets like thrown into a cage and he's like in a cage on his back. And he's like, don't make me hurt you. And it's like, my friend. You are useless at you this You are point. in no position <laughs> to be no. telling me, don't let make me. And it's the same thing with Harvey. It's like, don't make me hurt you. Like, fuck off. Like, I just grabbed the barrel of this gun. Don't Do you make think me I'm hurt. worried about you? Like, at this point, don't make me hurt you, exactly, motherfucker. You, you little, little man. Like, get out of here. So he grapples with Lorraine, and he's trying desperately to subdue her, but she's fighting like hell. Hell yeah. And during this whole fight, the gun goes off. I was waiting for you to say that. The bullet went through Lorraine's skirt, and it grazed her thigh. Oh. And she said, quote, I'll never forget the hideous sound of the bullet as it whined off into the night. Oh. Which I also thought was like a very beautiful way of saying that. That is, as it whined off into it was the like, night. It was like really scary and terrifying, but like beautiful at the same time. Yeah, it's poetic. She said she's very well spoken that way. Now, even Harvey was shocked by this. Because remember, he doesn't he, like trouble. And he doesn't like to he doesn't like to shoot the gun. He's Uh-oh. using the gun to scare people. He likes to use a rope. Yeah. Because he can take the rope off. He can wipe everything down. He doesn't leave a trace. Guns leave traces of people. They sure do. So he's like, that can be traced back to me. And apparently he was so shocked. He just goes, I shot you. Oh, my God. Like, was like shocked. And Lorraine was like, "Uh, yeah, but she wasn't going to sit there and ponder that with him for a little while. So she twisted out of his grasp because at this point he's grabbed her. Oh, my God. She twists out of there because she's like, you're a little fucking turd of a man. She twists out of there, jumps up, shot in the thigh, by the way, and runs the fuck out of there. Oh, my God. As she's running, she is tackled from behind like a fucking football player by Harvey coming out of his shocked stupor. Oh, my God. He tackled her down from behind. Luckily... He had not made it to his killing ground yet, the desert, where he feels comfortable taking Mm -hmm. his time and torturing women for fucking hours like a disgusting little maggot that he is. They were on the side of the highway, albeit in a pretty desolate area, about like 200 feet off the the actual highway, but it was a heavily traveled area. I was going to say, anybody could drive by at any moment. Exactly. And And he knows that. You know who did happen to come by? Like he said at any moment? Highway Patrolman Thomas Mulligan. Oh, sh- oh Thomas Mulligan. Thomas he knows Mulligan. what the fuck is up. Yeah, I, I have faith in Thomas Mulligan. He happened to be w- on his way home after his shift. Oh, man. He's like, I thought I was done for the night. And what's crazy is he didn't even see the two of them yet. He just saw Harvey's black Dodge on the side of the road. And thought someone was not having car trouble. Well, the dome light was on and both doors were open. Oh, shit. So he looks at it and he's like, that's suspicious. So he was like, I'm going to listen to my gut. So he just went to investigate it. And he came upon Harvey and Lorraine engaged in like a violent struggle. Oh, my God. Like, had no idea that's what he was coming up on. Harvey is such a scared little bunny when he is confronted with any kind of authority. So he stopped immediately when he saw the cop. Wow. This allowed Lorraine to jump up off the ground and literally just like sprint at the patrolman. And she's screaming, he's trying to kill me. He's trying to kill me. Later, after Harvey had been arrested, Mulligan described Harvey as having a, quote, lunatic stare. Oh, Jesus. And he said it took, quote, three or four minutes to get a hold of himself. Because he was just like out of it. Like, that's scary yeah and he said a lunatic stare it's like what we always point to like in the bundy case when he like lose like he's cool calm and collected in court and then and then loses it yep and you it's can so see scary it is literally like a flick of a switch it is and what's crazy is later after talking about it lorraine actually said that she bit his wrist at one point and he cried out during <gasps> that struggle like a little bitch and yeah the way she described it was i bit his wrist and he cried out then suddenly i found i had a gun in my hand i turned it around and pointed it at him 
If I had known how to fire it, I believe I could have killed him. But he just stood there and watched me, and after a while, the police came. Wow. I'm glad that she didn't kill him. Yeah. Because I want him to suffer in jail and serve time for everything that he's done to these women. Exactly. Including her. And I don't want her to have that on her head, that she had to kill someone. Yeah, because no matter who it is, like, that's a... That's a heavy load, I imagine, to take. So it's like, I don't want that on her. No. So Harvey was taken to the local sheriff's station, and he tried to explain that... He had only been in California for a few months. He had met that girl that night. And then he said he didn't have any plan to hurt her. He was just trying to scare her. Were they like, what's with all the rope and the gun then? And also, like, that's still fucked up, yeah, my you, guy. That's still not allowed. Even if this was true, which we know it's not, I was just trying to scare her is like, not a great excuse. Why, though? You were just trying to terrorize your community? That's it, like you're trying to terrorize this woman for no reason? Like, what's wrong with you? The fuck is that about? How is that a good excuse? And detectives didn't believe no. Harvey's story. They were like, yeah, no. Uh, fortunately, they didn't. So he was booked into the Orange County Jail that night on charges of attempted rape and assault with a deadly weapon. Good. Asshole. So he says, I love, I'm only trying to scare her. And it's like, okay, well, I'm only trying to scare you with a fucking prison sentence, you dick. Yeah, bye. How about that? Can I scare you with that? Right. Can I scare you with the electric chair? Like. That's pretty scary. Fuck you. So this was good. We finally have him. Yeah. And now that he's in custody and he's being charged, Harvey really tried to minimize all the events. I had a feeling that was going to happen. Yeah. He did. Uh, he did so he minimized everything but then he kind of essentially admitted that he was planning to sexually assault Lorraine oh good but he was definitely not going to tell them that he was planning to murder her when he definitely was Uh, at least not at first he wouldn't admit that he later does okay he said that he, you know, he was he was just trying to assault her, fellas. Like, come on, don't worry about it, everybody. Like, come on, like, just nah. guys being dudes. Just guys being dudes. Locker room talk. The problem was Harvey was never as smart or as stealthy, stealthy as he thought he was or wanted to be. No, and he, this whole story was so fucking cobbled together. He had a long criminal history of attacking women that mm-hmm. they now ha- were privy to, and detectives were beginning to get the feeling that there was. Something much bigger happening here. And not only just that he was planning to attack this woman and assault her. They were like, he was definitely going to hurt her at the very least. But we think he was going to try to kill her. Right. And now they're sitting there going, I think he might have done this before. Like, I think there's going to be more here. We should look into this. Thank gosh they had that feeling. Yeah. And luckily they sent an alert out to all the law enforcement agencies in the area. And detectives in Los Los Angeles thought you know what, we have a few missing women and we should see if we can tie these to him. That's a good thought, guys. There it you is. go. Maybe I'm glad you're thinking. I like it. And they sent two detectives to Orange County to interview Harvey. So detectives from OC and LA interrogated Harvey separately for days. Mm -hmm. They were hoping to crack him or just get him to slip up at all. And finally, they were successful. Yes. He agreed to take a polygraph test. And according to reports, quote, the polygraph needle about hit the ceiling when the administrator showed him a photograph of Ruth Mercado. Oh. Now, this was all it took. Like, he saw that needle go, boop, boop, boop. Like, he watched it like happen. Like, he knew that he was And caught. he goes, you can't beat the machine. I suppose you found my toolbox. You're just playing with me now. But they hadn't found his toolbox. They had not found his toolbox. Why would you just... I'm so happy he did. Like, well, why would you just offer that up? This is a case this where, like, crazy. IQ <laughs> does not correlate with common sense. Well, because it's, like, book smarts versus yes. street smarts. And also... Where it almost feels like he knew he had to be caught to stop. Yeah. Like, it's one of those things. I don't think he wanted to stop, but I think he knows, one, he doesn't want to go back to prison. No. He did not like prison. And two, I think he knows, like, this just isn't going to end. Like, I might as well just give it up because, like, just kill me instead. I think he'd rather die than Than go back to prison or any of that. And I think he's just so fucking cocky. Yeah. Like, I think it also has a lot to do with that. But like I said, they have not found his toolbox yet, which I'm also like, you didn't find it? 
because they searched his apartment. Uh, like, you didn't find that? So they, the LAPD detectives went back to the apartment to search again, and in a more thorough search, they found the toolbox. I'm like, you missed that the first time so around? So if he hadn't said that... They wouldn't have found it. No, and that's, like, I mean, the, like, those are literally smoking guns right there. And it was hidden in the garage. Guys, that's exactly where you find a toolbox. Like, it's not like he even put it, like, behind his air conditioner a la Dexter or something. It's like you didn't really have to look that far. Wow. How did you miss that? Thank yeah, goodness he's big an old idiot. Yikes. Yeah. And when they got the toolbox, obviously, they found 22 photos of Judy Dull, Shirley Bridgeford, and Ruth Mercado, both alive and dead. That's horrible. And as well as all this stuff, all the trophies that he had taken yeah. from them. Now... These photos, we were just talking about it, they're really disturbing. And it's not because they're graphic. No, they're they're really not graphic, but they are so graphic. They're emotionally all at the same graphic. Time. I well, I saw Elena looking at an article and I was like, are those the real photos? Yeah. And she was like, unfortunately, yeah. There's one, and I'm not sure what um which women which woman it was, but like she literally is crying. That's Shirley Bridgeford. That, like, you can, it's moments before she it's was killed. It's horrific because these pictures, the Shirley Bridgeford one, in she's particular. in the desert. She's on a blanket, just like he said. You, yep. you know how that night went. We talked about it in part one. She was not, um, she was not a model. This was the Lonely Hearts one yep. that he did. She was the she mom was just of out on a date. Right. And so, like, there was no tying up going to be happening in any sense of the word, like, for photos or anything like that. And in the photo, she's tied up on a blanket in crying. the middle of the desert, gagged, and she is crying. I and it's horrific to look at, and I don't recommend you look at it. Yeah, no. But please, if you are looking at it, like, when I saw it, I was like, that's someone's mom. You also just like, have that's to someone's wonder daughter. Like, how, fuck. how those photos get out there. Like, why were they those just released? Leaked? That's so fucked. Like, I don't know why anybody would want to see that. It's a very disturbing one. It, it is. really is. And it's all a very disturbing really one. And this Judy Dull sitting on a chair tied up and looking scared. But I think that was during the like session. Post, yeah. Like, but even still, but that's it's even like, scary too because like, you're like, it's right before. Yeah. Like it's right before. That's Those are her final moments. Yeah. I don't know her. I like don't have a connection to her other than this case. I, do, I shouldn't see that. Like that's not for my eyes. Yeah. It's you know? one of those things. It's like. I I feel like my opinion on crime scene photos have sh has shifted a lot. Yeah, as we've gone through this podcast, I think honestly, no, I agree. looking at so many, I think it's like it's changed the way I view them, and I think I kind of look at looking at these. I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't think I'm supposed to see that. I think it's a little inhumane, personally, because I said to Elena, I was like, if that if I knew that article was out there and that had happened to you, like I had to literally put myself in that situation, and I was like flicking through an article and I saw like you. Yeah, like crying on a blanket about to be I, brutally strangled. One, I couldn't imagine being your family and seeing that. And two, I couldn't imagine being your family and knowing how many people had clicked on that article and saw you like my like I'm gonna cry right in your now. final like, moment. In your like, final moment. Like that's that's not that's it's not for really, public yeah. consumption. It really is. It like a it, photo it changed is a my lot. view a lot. A photo is a lot. It is. And I think it's because I don't know. I don't know. These ones, these ones changed a lot of my view because they're different. They're a different kind of crime scene photo. They are. They're not of a dead body. They're not of uh, a graphic in the in the bloody or gory sense mm -hmm. of the word. But these ones are like emotionally graphic. They are. And and I'm not used to that. You know, like the like seeing someone like. Um, I don't, I don't know. It's just, it's like a, th these ones bum me out. I these don't think they should they, be out uh, there. All crime scene photos bum me out. Yeah. These ones just like hit different. You're just like, oof. Like, I think. I don't know. And I, they're taken by him. And the, I don't right. know. That's some like, because crime scene photos in general are usually taken by police officers mm -hmm. or crime scene technicians, obviously. And like autopsy photos yeah, and all those, yeah. those, those feel more clinical and a little more like a fit. I don't know how to Well, no, it. and I, I think that's exactly what we're getting at here is that like this these is, aren't clinical. These, these are him. weren't to assess anything at the scene. No, these, these were, were for him. These were for him. And now we're looking at them. And like yeah. we're not sitting there like staring at them. But like if you yeah. read an article about this, it'll pop up. You're probably so you going to see one. But yeah, I think that's what it is. I think it's that they're they were taken by him. Yeah. 
and that and they're the final that's moments upsetting. of these women's lives. Yeah, because I can just and you look at the angle they're taking. You're like, he's just standing over them. It's yeah. just I don't. No, nah, it's I didn't like. It's it. It's upsetting. I just want you guys to know that if you if you stumble across them, because you likely will if you look up this case, they're kind of everywhere. Oh, but, if you Google his name, it's like yeah. some of them are like in the first three. Mm. And they look like they're not real, but they're very real. Yeah. Um. But yeah, it, it, it's definitely the the photographer that bothers me. Mm -hmm. I don't like that we're looking at it through his because we're looking at it through his eyes. Yeah. And I don't like that. No. Uh. But yeah, that's just <laughs> the evolution that of our on view that. on crime scene photos. Um. But the discovery of these photos and the trophies that were in the toolbox, that was all detectives needed to tie the three murders to Harvey. Yeah. Like, boom. Here they are. Like Thank you, you for that box. The pictures. He knew it. At this point. So yeah. he was like, yep. So it almost seemed, again, like he was... Detectives thought he seemed relieved to be caught. Hmm. I don't know if this has to do with some kind of, like, you know, psychology here that he was feeling like an urge that could not be tampered. So he was feeling like, I need to be stopped. Okay. I don't know if I agree with that from what I've read about him. But, like, who am I? I wasn't there. Well, and there's so much weird psychology that we just don't even know about when it comes to people killing people. And yeah. Especially serial killers that I think... It could be anything at exactly. this point. Exactly. I think it does... It, it was definitely clear that he was beginning to lose lose it. And mm -hmm. he was beginning to lose his grasp on normal reality. reality and being able to play the two sides of his life, which were, I'm a TV repairman. No, I'm this. And it's like... I think he wasn't able to straddle that line anymore. And so I think because he was unable to control his urges anymore, that was becoming an issue. And maybe that's why they saw it as him being relieved. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. Um, but now that he was safely in custody, he began tell to telling detectives just every detail about the murders. And they said, and this is why I kind of like go back and forth, he was almost boasting about how he'd found the women and lured them to their deaths. Well, what I was going to say, too, actually, and it's perfect that you just said that, maybe he was also, like, in a weird way excited that this was all going to, like, he was finally going to get his big moment and finally he was going to be seen by yep. women across the world and that were going to be afraid of him. Yes. You know, maybe that was the relief. I could of definitely like, see that. It was a relief of I'm not invisible anymore. Yeah, absolutely. Because he did mention before he wanted to do something different. Right. And he wanted to be famous. And... and here you go. Yep. Now, the evidence in the toolbox, according to him, was kept so that if he was ever caught, he would be convicted. Mm -hmm. um, he said, I quote, I didn't have the guts enough to give myself up. I wanted to, but I just couldn't. This, of course, was a lie. Yeah, like, I don't, I don't believe, believe that that's a lie. I, he did not keep. Now, that was according to him, remember? Yeah. He did not keep that toolbox just to get convicted. That's not what that no, was. He wanted to Good revisit try, it. Harvey. That was trophies. Yeah. That was you because you were reliving them. You wanted to open it. You wanted to touch it. You wanted to think about it. You wanted to be back at that place. Shut the fuck up with this. I wanted to be convicted. I just didn't have the guts to turn back. Shut up. Yeah. Shut up. Yeah. Just admit that you're a disgusting little worm person and that you like to open this toolbox and touch all the things that you had taken from these women and look at these photographs of them in their last moments and that you And go back took. to that moment. And go back to that moment. Just admit it, yeah. you disgusting little worm. Yeah. Admit it. But he won't. He's going to sit there and pretend that he just wanted to get caught. And this, it's ridiculous. Now... Harvey was determined not to go back to prison. He definitely didn't. He immediately asked for the death penalty. He was like, I don't want to. I don't want a prison sentence. Okay, uh, it's not really yeah. about what you want right now. Yeah, you don't really this get to like, pick um, the but, law, but cool. So after the confession, he agreed to take the detectives out to the desert and to the crude grave sites of Shirley and Ruth. I'm glad because that, remember Judy was found. And were they able to be like put to a final resting place? They were, but when they did unearth the remains, the San Diego coroner Al Gallagher said that the remains were quote little more than a bag of bones. That's really sad. Which is very sad. Now on November fifth, nineteen fifty eight, he was taken to the San Diego County Sheriff's Office. And he kept right on confessing, but this time they recorded it. Mm -hmm. So they have a whole record of it. He went through the details of each murder, how he did it, and he insisted he had two motives. And this is when he talks about this. He said, quote, my primary motive, I did want to take some pictures. Mm -hmm. Which is like, that's not a motive, dude. Like, that's not, you're gross. That's, like, you can take photos and not murder people. 
He said, but aside from that, I was interested in having sexual relations. Relations. Wow. So you were interested in raping. Exactly. Why don't you why don't you call it what it is, right. Harvey? Because you can have sexual relations if you build a relationship yeah. with somebody, which like you should have taken a crack at that, but you never literally never did. And that's what kills me. It's like you're an idiot. Because it's like you you even signed up for a lonely hearts thing. You could have you found went out someone. with Shirley. You were on a date with her. Mm-hmm. If you had liked her, she seemed like a nice, nice woman. You sh- you could have gone on several dates and, and you built. could have gotten to know each other. And then she would have been comfortable maybe becoming more intimate with you but later. No, That's wanted, how you do things. He wanted what he wanted, he wanted and he now. wanted to take it. Exactly. And it's like, fuck you. Stop calling it sexual relations. That's Say not what you it wanted is. to rape women because you didn't want to have sex with them. No. Because if you did, sex you would have formulated a relationship and had consensual sex with people. Yep. But no, you wanted to take it. You wanted to rape. Exactly. You disgusting little worm. But he went into such a scary voice. He's so disgusting. He went into graphic detail. Ugh. He included his bullshit thoughts about the how he thought some of the women enjoyed themselves with him. That's yeah. so fucking beyond. So foul. So foul. Like wow. He said he didn't use a gun because it. He didn't use a gun to kill them because it would be traced back to his gun. Mm-hmm. And he said strangling left less physical evidence. I also don't necessarily think that's true. I think I don't think so. He, I think he maybe discovered that along the way. But I think no matter what, the rope would have been involved somehow because it had been involved since he was three years old. Ding ding ding. That's yeah. literally my next thing. He just. It was a fetish. Yeah. This was his fetish. Yeah. A dangerous one. And like, I think, this was one that was, like, beyond. Right. And sure, I'm sure he realized, like, when he got that gun, you know, oh, I probably shouldn't shoot this because it could be traced back to me. But that, but wasn't, that wasn't the primary. Why. That wasn't yeah. the, the, exactly, exactly. Like, the primary thing was he enjoyed using a rope. That's how he. That's how he liked to do it. Yeah. That's, like, it's, and you know what? He had that, since like, that predilection since he was very young. Right. Obviously, like you said, I don't even think he could. He might not have even recognized that that was what it was. Yeah. But it that was what it was. Exactly. <laughs> like it absolutely was. But the confession went on for hours until he had finally given every single detail of the crimes against the four women. And then he was returned to his cell where he was immediately put on suicide watch because mm. he had made several comments about potentially killing himself. Right. Now, from the moment he was arrested, San Diego and Los Angeles prosecutors constantly had to worry about him taking his own life because he was constantly talking about it. Um, And they were also worried about him making a pretty convincing bid for the insanity defense. Yeah. They were worried about that. Um, And they didn't want him to possibly win his freedom back at some point. No, 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 no. So Ophelia, actually, prior to his arraignment, Ophelia, his mom, visited him in jail. And on her way out of the jail, she said to the press... Talk to any of the people in the jail. He is not vicious. He's sick. Ophelia. Don't say anything. Ophelia, say so much less. If that's what you're going to say. He's not vicious. Don't say anything. Because that is so disrespectful to anyone who was related to one of those women who were viciously attacked vicious viciously raped and viciously murdered he spent on his own admission five to ten minutes strangling them until there was no signs of life that in and of itself that little like that's not a little part of what he did but that small piece of the full operation is vicious so vicious and he's a rapist exactly he's a rapist ophelia the entire operation abducting women is vicious like come on like i understand it's your son or his mother and i understand you wanting to say he is sick and because in some sense he is sick and if you want to just like sit around and say that to yourself to get by and make the days go on by all means but don't put that into the public where it's going to be like eaten up and and don't you dare on say he is not vicious no. to the press. No. Like, don't say it. That is just... Because he is. That is minimizing. Yeah. Like, that's really fucked up. such an insane level. And don't say talk to any of the people in the jail. I've said this once. I'll say it again, Ophelia. There's no women in that jail. Right. He's in a jail with men. Right. Of course he's not fucking up in there. Why don't we talk to Lorraine and find yeah. out if he's vicious? Because she fucking lived that. You want to ask it. her about it? You want to look at the probably scar on her leg from when he shot her in the fucking leg and he's not vicious? It's like, come on, man. Like, but, girly ugh. girl. I know. I... 
It's one of those things. It's like I know you're his mother. Yeah, I and I know that, that he's like, yeah, he is sick. And but... I know this is a loss. You know, in, this is a tragedy for you as mm-hmm. well. This is your child who has done this. And I understand again saying he's sick. Yeah, and I'm. You know, you do you, whatever. But to but say, don't say he's, he's not, not vicious, vicious, that's like, whoa, dude. Like, yeah. don't do that. So on November 8th, 1958, a grand jury convened in the San Diego courthouse, County Courthouse, and he was indicted for the March 9th murder of Shirley Ann Bridgeford and July 24th murder of Ruth Mercado. Okay. A few weeks later, on November 21st, he appeared before Judge John, uh, I think it's Hewicker, in Department 4 of Superior Court. He pled guilty, and the sentencing was deferred until a later date. Okay. But we all knew that he was asking for the death penalty. Now, again, this was a death penalty case. That's what they were. That was that was what was on the table. So there was going to be a lot of red tape galore. But in the meantime, Ophelia just kept talking about Harvey just being girl shy and not understanding how to be around women. I don't think he's girl shy. I think he's raped several women at this point. I don't really know if I would call that shy. Mm, Yeah. And she was just ignoring the assaults and robberies he had committed over the years, just minimizing the straight up murder that he yeah, had committed. That's fucked. And Dr. J.P. Hilton, that first psychiatrist that evaluated Harvey right. when he was a child, he actually wrote to the probation officer and he said that, yeah, he did have trouble with women and said that he had become increasingly aggressive towards females as he grew older. Mm-hmm. So Ophelia's trying to minimize and this doctor's like, ah, uh, yeah, sure, he does have trouble with women, but that's making him aggressive towards them. Yeah. So... They tried very hard to prove that he was simply mentally ill and not competent to stand trial, but it wasn't working. Okay, good. He was very clearly antisocial and very delusional, that is for sure. But he was clear when he was questioned, you know, that before committing the murders, he said that he was feeling some kind of way about it. Right. That alone is you saying... I know what I was doing was wrong. Yeah. But I went ahead and did it anyway. Mm -hmm. That's you saying I have a clear idea of what's right and wrong, but I decided to do it anyway. And now I feel bad. Exactly. Like you, he sold himself down the river, even when he was lying. So on December 15th, 1958, he appeared in the Superior Court for the sentencing. And he definitely, he told his lawyers, do not stop me from getting the death penalty. But legally... They had an obligation to mount some kind of defense. They couldn't just be like, sure. So to make it harder to do that, the prosecutor, William Lowe, he learned all about his criminal past, you know, how dangerous he was to society when he was in New York, how he was like the phantom and like all that. And they presented a great case with all the confessions, witnesses. They included testimony from Lorraine Vigil. In the end, he was found guilty of two counts of first degree murder. And again, he wanted to be executed at the earliest possible date, but neither Harvey nor his attorney had anything to say when the verdict was given. They were like, I'm not speaking because I want to be executed. What are you going to say at that point anyway? Other than I'm sorry, but it's too late But he's not even going to say that. Judge Hewicker actually had a lot to say, though. (laughs) I love when the judge has a lot to say. Yeah, he had been sitting here. He had listened to the entire thing. He heard the detailed descriptions of how he had murdered these women. And after everything had gone down, he said this. I know there are a lot of people, people in high places that don't believe in capital punishment. Now, if life imprisonment in California meant life imprisonment, that would be one thing. Life imprisonment in this state means confinement for seven years or more. And when I say more, it depends on the past record of the defendant. If a law could be passed and placed in the Constitution so that each legislature couldn't come along and modify it, if they made life imprisonment, life imprisonment without the possibility or p- of pardon or parole, that would be one thing. But we don't have that. We will never have it. And there are some crimes that are so revolting that, in my opinion, there is only one penalty that can be imposed, and that penalty is the death penalty. Yeah. Which I understand what he's saying about the life imprisonment thing. I do too. Because <clears throat> I mean, we've said this a million times about the... We're, we're gray. Yeah, that we're gray on the... I, I'm leaning more towards against it. But 
I, I do get that. That it's like, yeah, it would be nice if life imprisonment was a thing for these assholes. Right. But a lot of times it's not. Yeah. Even we, when you get sentenced to life, it's not even life. Exactly. And so after this was said, the clerk said, Harvey Murray Glattman, you are have heretofore been charged in an indictment by the grand jury of this county to which you have heretofore entered a plea of guilty as to both counts. And it is ordered that the death sentence be imposed. Mm-hmm. Harvey was sent to San Quentin Prison in uh, January 1959. He sat on death row, but we know that's never the end because any death penalty case triggers an automatic appeal to be heard from the Superior Court. His was found was heard by the Supreme Court of uh, California on June 5th, 1959. So he did appeal. It's like an automatic appeal. Oh, yeah, I don't it just think triggers I an automatic that. appeal. They reviewed the evidence. They found that there was no error in uh, anything. Yeah, no. <laughs> they upheld everything. Uh, at 10 a.m. on September 18th, 1959, he was led from his cell to the gas chamber at San Quentin. He was seated, strapped into a chair. At 10.03 a.m., the cyanide tab was dropped, releasing gas into the room. He apparently, according to witnesses, started inhaling very deeply. Um, he wanted it to be people quick. People think that that was probably the reason. for. And what happens in these scenarios is you just kind of watch the pulse go boop, boop, sure. boop, boop, boop. And it plummeted. He was pronounced dead at 10.12 a.m. So from 10.03 to 10.12 is how long it took. That's not very long. I don't know how long these those things normally take, but I was like, whoa. So that was the end of Harvey Glattman. Bye! But... If you remember, throughout the second half of the, if you remember, I'm like, if you remember, throughout the second half of the 20th century, (laughs) if you remember that. (laughs) I think I do. Yeah. California became a place of lots of serial killers. Cray cray in the bright bright. Many serial killers. And a lot of times as we got later and later, they got those crazy, you know, monikers in Mm -hmm. the press when we couldn't identify them. And it kind of was like an epidemic, like it seemed like for a while. But in 1958, when all this was going on, nobody really could even conceive of a Harvey Glattman. Mm-hmm. You know, like this this was a monster that we had not yet studied and not yet understood. Yeah. Not that we were going to understand. But obviously he eventually got a nickname, like the Glamour Girl Slayer, because yeah. everybody always attributes a nickname to it. But when he, it was going on, he really, it wasn't a huge story. It was like, a, it was a big That's story, crazy. but it wasn't what it would be now. It wasn't sensationalized. Or what it would be in like the 70s or the 80s, you mm-hmm. know, like any of those. But in April of 1954, after he had been released, then this was before he had started this killing spree. Yeah. It was after he had been released from Sing Sing. Okay. And before he'd moved from California, that little span of time. Yeah, yeah. There was a body discovered oh shit in the that span of time where he was out of prison not in california and this body was discovered in boulder hills which is just a short drive from denver Mm -hmm. if you remember he was living in in colorado yeah so this was a nude body of a young woman this woman was a jane doe for more than 50 years oh my god until 2008 when investigators in colorado said that they were tentatively identifying her as Catherine E. Ferrand Dyer, which was a young woman who lived in a Denver boarding house not far from where Harvey was staying with his parents. Oh, shit. Now, the investigation had been reported a short time earlier after various exchanges of information on a public message board that linked this Jane Doe to Harvey Glattman. Mm -hmm. People were starting to talk about it. The reason was the timeline fit, the methods fit, and a lot of the facts of the case were fitting. Facts like Jane Doe had been hit by a car just shortly before her death, and the measurements of the vehicle were the exact match of Henry, uh, Harvey's car at the time. Wow. And even more to add to that, when you're, like, hit by a car, like, you Yeah, because I'm like, what? During his interrogation in Orange County, detectives asked Harvey about his time in Colorado. Mm-hmm. And he explained that he had photographed some women in Colorado while in Denver, and when detectives the detectives were basically like, are they dead or are they alive? Did yeah. you leave them alive? He was like, no, they were mostly, he's like, I think they were all alive. And then he smirked and said, unless they've been run over. <gasps> yep. Oh, shit. Unless they've been run over. And this girl was hit by a car. Why would you, like, <clears throat> why would he say that? Like, And he smirked. Wow. Yeah. Add to this the newly conducted autopsy found that the young woman had been bound at the wrist and ankles 
in exactly the same way that he would bound, bind his other victims. Right. And it fits his M.O. But obviously Harvey had been long dead by this time. By the time she's identified. And it kind of seemed like they were never going to con- connect the necessary dots. But a year after Colorado detectives first said that they identified this body, this is wild, the real Catherine Dyer was found alive in, re- in, in Queensland, Australia. Okay, so they so had falsely identified her. this. Now, apparently at this point, care workers were preparing to move this woman they knew as Barbara into an assisted living facility. When they did that, they came across a ton of items that belonged to someone named Catherine Dyer. They dug a little deeper and they learned that Barbara was in fact Catherine Dyer. She had disappeared from Colorado more than a half century earlier. And they were like, what the fuck is going on? But she wouldn't talk about it. Like she didn't want to say why she had disappeared. She didn't want to say any of that. Uh So there was a press briefing on this story and Boulder detective uh, Steve Ainsworth said Catherine Dyer was, quote, quite a mysterious person. Even before she disappeared, there is not a lot known about her life. I think for some reason she didn't want to be found. Okay. Now that's interesting. So you're like, whoa, okay, what's happening? In and of itself. Now Ainsworth, that detective, he remained committed to identifying this Boulder Falls Jane Doe. And in in the fall of 2019, or excuse me, fall of 2009, through DNA technology, he was able to identify the remains as Dorothy Gay Howard, who was a 16-year-old runaway from Phoenix, Arizona. 16? Yep. It was actually in 2004 that historian historian Sylvia Petham took to the, like, she took some interest in this case, yeah. the Jane Doe, and she asked if they could exhume the Jane Doe's body. And she was able to get, per, like, they were able to do it, like, right. official permission to do it. And then they were able to reconstruct what she looked like. Mm-hmm. And when they did that, they published this reconstruction in an article um, with, like, Sylvia's stuff about it. And it was seen by Dorothy's grandniece, Michelle. That's okay. how she was found to be that. Because she was like, that's Dorothy. Like, yeah, she had like known I the story her, about yeah. her. And she got in touch with authorities, gave her DNA. They connected them and were able to identify this Jane Doe that and way. And so was she definitely murdered by Harvey, they think? Now, Ainsworth... So, that's the problem. So Ainsworth believes Dorothy had run away. That's why she was in Colorado. She right. ran away from um, her husband in Phoenix, like a bad situation, and had come to Denver to visit an aunt, and a week later, she disappeared without a trace. Now, they said around this time, scores of women and girls had vanished around this time in Boulder Canyon. Mm-hmm. The majority of which are unsolved. Wow. Officials truly believe she is a victim of Harvey Glattman, and but they have not been able to confirm it. Unless they got run over. He didn't say like he unless it they seemed got run like over. he was talking about multiple people. So maybe he changed his I would be willing to bet that some of these women are some of his first kills. Wow. I would be willing to bet that. That's I really the thing would. because even like the first one in California, he did seem to know what he was doing and he did seem to have confidence and that that's the thing. And, like, t- and he like went right to her apartment even. Yeah, Judy Ann Dull. It seemed like he was pretty confident. Like yeah. you said, like he, I think you're right. I think he had done this before in some yeah. other capacity. Yeah. And he found what worked. Wow. Because the fact that he drove her out to the desert, this guy drove like 100 miles away right. to the desert he had the blanket in his back, in his trunk. He had the rope. He had it all set up. He did the same thing for each one. He had done that and, and figured it out before. Why did he did a, he did leave Colorado pretty abruptly? That's what I was thinking. Why did you leave? Right. He had he really had no reason to go out to California. Yeah. He left because he figured he could do it out there now. Wow. And because he's, he'd already been arrested in Cal in in Colorado. And he had already photographed women in Colorado. Right. So he had already started that whole shtick. So I got to start somewhere new. And it's like now he knows if he goes to L.A., he can get even more women even easier through that whole shtick. Holy so shit. So he had perfected his way. I guarantee you, I'm like, let's DNA test these. But like, let's figure this out. I need to like nail this fucker with more people because I want to know. Damn. I know is... he's done more. 
Such a wild story. Yeah. I, I know this story and like I knew most of it, but I did not know about that last piece that Isn't there's it another wild? victim that, that one could of potentially be many his. that are his. It just fits too perfect. The fact or, that, that like killed, the say. fact she was hit by a car and it matched the measurements of his car. Yeah. The fact that she was bound in exactly the same way. She was very pretty. And then he said that. And then the fact that he said... He, he had photographed women in Colorado, and he had left them alive unless they got hit by a car. Like, why Hold would up. you like, say that? Are you that? fucking... Like, why would you pull that out of your ass? Like, why did he say that? Holy He said that because he knows you're not going to catch him. Mm-hmm. Fucking Harvey Gladman. Damn. Disgusting little worm boy. Bye, bitch. Bye, Harvey. Wow. I feel like I need something, like, spooky after that. I know. Ugh. That was crazy. I need some spooky. Well, we'll do a listener tale. Yeah, we'll get a listener tale between there. Perfect. But then you're getting more carnage, so. Yeah, I, stay I got tuned. a rough one for yeah. you. So stay um, tuned. I like a sad one. It's it's a very different murder case. My Ooh. next my next case. That's unfortunate. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah. But um yeah, so we hope that you keep listening and, and you'll hear all of that. And we hope you keep it weird. weird, but not so weird that you say that you hope that someone didn't get hit by a car if you know full well that you hit them with your car and also don't kill people. Bye. Prime members, you can listen to Morbid early and ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. Or you can listen ad-free with Wondery Plus and Apple Podcasts. Before you go, tell us about yourself by completing a short survey at wondery.com survey.